All right, we're a minute early. Uh, oh no, actually, it's Hi. right on 4 p.m. Hello. Everybody. Welcome to in session number 11. <clears throat> session 11. Yeah. Oh, I've got the wrong website up. <clears throat> we just wanted to basically, but everybody kind of knows what in session is by now, right? We should maybe just yeah, be repeating that you can go to derivative.ca slash in session to uh, uh, fill out the form and become a guest. Yeah. Instantly. Instantly, kind of. Yeah. Uh, but if you have any questions that Marcus or Jared or any of our other developers can help you with, this is a really good opportunity to uh, have your questions answered, learn some new tricks, and uh, the last form. Exactly. So let's see who is with us today. Ta da! Yeah, I'm very excited. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Hello, Paola. Paola. Welcome. Paula is, uh, Thank you. Paula Thank is, you. Uh, from, yeah, uh, you're, uh, you're tuning in from Santiago de Chile. Yeah. On this lovely day. And uh, many of you may know Paula from uh, her Instagram account, Paula Olea. Um, she's a digital artist and coder, also co founder of uh, Rio Collective. And you also are right now teaching video game design in university. So are you busy or busy? <laughs> yeah, I'm busy. I, I'm do, I do a lot of things. So it's like video games, art, installation. So yeah, a lot of things. Um, so uh, we were talking earlier and uh, you actually come from a, a, a graphic design background, uh, that's correct? Yes, I study graphic design and then I work a lot in different uh, agencies, uh, agencies in advertising. So I start in, in editorial design and then I jump to front end, website, and then installations. It's, it's like Arduino, visual thinking, processing, open frameworks, and right now in top designer or sometimes in Unity. So I do a lot of stuff because I think my path or my journey uh, in my jobs, jobs was trying to learn everything I could. And for me, it's like I, I need to under understand things. So it's like, oh, what is this? How I can do this? OK, I need to learn this 3D or uh, code and then another thing and another. So yes, it's a long journey, but it's, it's fun. Yeah, Isabel, short, um, short interruption. Um, mm -hmm. Apparently your voice is a little bit low. Um, I don't know why. If you can speak directly into the microphone. Hello, can you hear me now? I think it's good, yeah. Okay, it. okay, yeah. Yeah, no, it, it's quite amazing the number of tools in your, uh, in your repertoire and mm -hmm. also Code in C++, and uh, that's yeah. a lot of, it's a lot of, a lot of, a lot of learning for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If, if, I think when I try to think why I'm doing all this stuff, maybe it's because when I was younger, I have all these questions like uh, how uh, I can turn a light, how this working, what happened in between. It's like it's not magic. Huh. And maybe uh, that is the way how, why I jump to Arduino, trying to understand how I can uh, understand the machines, or I can control, I don't know, a microwave or a, a bending machine. How? What is this? The electronic thing. And then, oh, okay, I need to understand code. What I, if I want to create visuals? Okay, I can do. I can use this. I don't know, processing or open frameworks and a, a lot of stuff it's like. I need to understand a lot of things, okay. so that is the reason why, why I I know all these language or softwares. Pretty impressive. So, so with Rio, you do a lot of um, you do a lot of in interactive installations, and most of your work seems to be for museums. I guess that's that's an intentional uh, career path. Yes, it's intentional. I think 
three years ago, I co-founded Brillo with my friends, and and we try to get out of these advertising agencies because it's different the products. So we decided to only focus in museums because the target or the users we have, we work with adults and kids. So it's a lot of different people that can enjoy uh, our experience. So yeah, I think one is the, the, the most important thing is the people, their emotions. It's right to bring, to enjoy, or feel feel again like a kid and try to, I don't know, play with all, all these installations. Yeah, yeah. yeah, there was an interesting uh, quote on your website that, uh, that how technology applied to museums has changed from uh, before where it was about seeing things, now it's becoming more about living, sort of living things and kind yeah. of being, being in it. Because the other thing is that there seems to be a lot of physical computing. There's a real physical element to most of your, uh, most of your installations, right? Yeah, it's maybe not, it's because... It's not just yes. a screen. Yeah, maybe it's because I, 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 I'm, my generation is, I born uh, where... I, we discover what is use a computer, but I have the memory using Lego and discover building things or try to touch and, and move things. So I think we try to recover that feeling. It's like, it's n not only on the screen, it's like, no, we need to put a button or a switch or maybe move your body and we use the Kinect, but we try to not put everything on, on a screen or not touch, not uh, multi-touch or touch screen, but it's like feeling, use the, you, your feeling of touch or smell or, or see, it's all right. try to use the perception. Yeah, sort of engaging more senses than just yes. looking, yeah. So how did, uh... How did touch designer did touch did, did did when you started using touch designer did it change at all what how you do your work or was there any uh, any impact? Uh, yes, was <laughs> yes. I think it changed a lot of things because I come from the the world of code, so I need to imagine everything. It's like okay, I need to do this. This is first. This is second. I need to connect this second with the third. Was everything in my mind? So for me, was the designer was, I don't know, was it was like my mind was open to a new possibilities. Uh, and the, the good thing in, on touch designer is I can do a lot of things. Like I can connect the Kinect, I can connect the Oculus, I, I, the, the, the MIDI or the Arduino is so easy. It's everything there. For example, with uh, Unity, you need a lot of things like, oh, I need a plugin or an asset. It's like, oh, I need something else for create something. Uh, it's the same maybe with processing open frameworks. But a designer for me is easy. I can see it's easy. Right. It's easier to use the nodes, the blocks, because I'm a graphic designer. So for me, I think mm -hmm. all the time in visual thing. So it's like, oh, I can see the noise. I can see this other element I can connect I can, and I can see the result. The difference with the other is like, okay, I need to imagine what noise I'm writing right now. And then uh -huh. I think it's connecting with this. So for me, and I reached a point it was difficult to create the visuals I wanted to create. So to design it is, for me, it's an easy way to create things. And the cool thing in to design it is you have a lot of switch or buttons or number and at the beginning, the way I learned to design it was moving things. Like, oh, what happened if I put a noise here? What happened if I put, a, I don't know, a fractal and then a twist? And I'm moving things, in, in the good thing is I have a result and I can see it. So it was a good and nice journey to learn to design it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes me very happy to hear that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's the kind of the exploratory process that I uh, yeah. like people taking and there because there's yeah you don't break anything there's always something to discover mm -hmm. um, yeah nice. for example I do visuals like I try it every day 
And for me, I, it's like the rule, okay, I want to create, or, I don't know, a world with a concept, or, I don't know, translucent, or full color, or gradients, a lot of things. It, for me, it's like, okay, I have this, I don't know, noise with a sphere. And then, okay, I, the good thing in third design is like, I can move one thing and I can create something completely different with the same base, it's like a sphere with a noise. So every time it's like, okay, a sphere and a noise, and then I put a uh, fong material or PVR, and then, okay, this is okay. What if I put, um, I don't know, a uh, grain or, or change the color? What if I put or particles and, and change it and change it and change with the same base what I did, I don't know, months ago? So everything, for me, I think I have a word, a phrase. It's like, what if, what if I do this? What if I change this? And I have many results. So that is the cool thing. Nice. Maybe I should actually switch that to some of the uh, because you have been creating yeah. um, on your Instagram. Also, you've been posting a lot of these uh, results yeah. of that. So I just switched really? a little bit to those uh, loops. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah I remember. I think last year, I I I, I watched it. Uh, tutorial on YouTube it was okay oh very nice material and I love it and I think I worked for two hours or maybe three it was oh, I have 30 visuals for a, one month so it was oh, wonderful so that is the cool <laughs> thing for me it was it was so intuitive and was natural for me create and move what if I change this and the other another and there for three hours I learned a lot I create a lot of visual for me it was okay I did it great <laughs> so that is the cool thing so you didn't have to do anything for 29 days if you had 30 visuals in one day? <laughs> yes, it was nice. I think uh, I, I talked with a friend. It was, Daniela, Daniela, you need to see this. I created all this visual in one day. It was nice. <laughs> <laughs> I'm amazing. Yeah. Points to the fact that we need a simple way to output like 20 second or one minute things and just post automatically. Yeah, from, from touch. Design, from touch, sure. yeah. Sure. So. What's the uh, what's the touch designer community like in uh, in Chile? Is it? Uh, I mean, I, I'm aware of a few people, but uh... yeah, I for me, uh, I I know a few people from here Chile, uh, from here in Chile, but I talk a lot with Alfredo. Alfredo is in, on Instagram is Norte Sur or na North and South in English, but it's Norte Sur. And he taught me to designer. He was the person who was he, who showed me all these. Um, <laughs> for me, it's amazing software. So he did a class. I went to the class. It was oh, what is this? And he was very kind to uh, teach us all the the students there. And then when I a few few days later, I have a lot of questions. It's like how I I can do this? How uh, he can did this. It's like a lot of questions, and he was very kind to answer all my question I, ha I had. So uh, um, he's very nice. Uh, uh, so I'm very uh, it's, it's like grateful or thankful for thankful. He, yeah. yes yes for um, teach me. And I know I know a few, yeah, I know a few people not too much. But I, I learned a lot of things on, on on YouTube with William or a lot of Paquita 12. So for me, it was YouTube more mm -hmm. the, the community here in Chile. Yes, the community is the community is very very active, and especially during the pandemic, there were so many tutorials and so many mm, yes yes and, so, uh, yes. So maybe I, I want to, uh, maybe next month, or, I don't know, April or May, I want to create tutorials in Spanish because it's a very difficult problem to uh, learn uh, learn tutorials or tutorials in English. So yeah, I want to, Alfredo, Alfredo taught me, so I tried, I want to do the same. It's like, okay, I, I have this knowledge. I, I learn a lot how I can do for other people. Uh, learn so it's tutorial in Spanish. So okay, yeah. that would be great. Thank you. Yeah. So now that we're looking at Instagram, I kind of wanted to talk to Paula about some of her Brio projects. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of VR too. I love the um, the mushroom one. Haifa. 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 
Yeah, yeah, I faz, uh, yeah, yeah, I faz a project of, uh, of uh, not by Natalia Cabrera. She's a storytelling creative, and she contacted us to create the art, the 3D, and the all development thing. And IFA is a, an immersive virtual reality story where the user can experience the life cycle of a mushroom to understand the importance of the fungi kingdom. So mm -hmm. was uh, was I think one of the hardest projects I ever <laughs> did because was a big project. It was a lot of scenes. Uh, I need to understand a lot of new things in Unity. Uh, we have a good hardware, a good computer, so we need to use high quality or high definition uh, 3D models. So it was nice. I think at the time I, I was sick I, because it was a lot of work, it was oh, so much. Mm -hmm. um, but I learned a lot, it was difficult to create things and put a lot of people working together. And I remember it was in, I think, November, October 19, was the, here in Chile, started the protest. So it was crazy trying to work together and at the same time was, but it's a pro protest outside and we tried, uh, tried to work at home, but it was a little crazy at the time. But the good thing is uh, Haifa was uh, presented at the Sundance Festival. Yeah. So yeah, it was nice That's because fun. I think it was the, the first project, uh, international project, where it was in a, a festival. So it was nice, it was cool to mm -hmm. uh, work with this fun fungi kingdom. Mm -hmm. So yeah, was a then, yeah was a was a challenge for me. It was yeah, a challenge. Yeah. What about the um, what about the other project where uh, um. It's going up the Nile, and you actually built a physical boat, uh, La Barca. Yeah. Yeah. La Barca. Was that La Barca after Digital. or before? Yeah. It's like the boat, the Barca. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes. That was, I think, 2016. I think so. It was my first virtual reality project, and I remember that because um, was I, I, I was a new job. I was the new in the office. And Javier, right now, is my uh, business partner. We were together at the time. He said to me, okay, Paola, we have this new project, uh, but it's in a virtual reality. And at the at that point, uh, I never opened Unity in my life. Okay, <laughs> and was, okay, okay, Paola, I'm going to do the art, but I'm going to vacation for a month, so you need to do, uh, do the project. It was, oh. <laughs> For a moment, okay, it was crazy. So for me, it took me two weeks for learning Unity. It was okay. I have two weeks. I need to watch all the tutorials I, I can, and then okay, first the uh, the uh, first day was okay. I need to create a project and it started. The problem was uh, we and at the, that point I couldn't find any example doing virtual reality in a Gear VR and or in an Android. So it was complicated. It was for me, it's like, okay, I can do this. And then I think at the middle of the project, uh, I think Unity released an example of virtual reality in the Samsung. It was okay. I put, I remember, I put my project, my script, and the example was mm, okay. Right. I need to do, uh, I do it again and I start again in the middle of the project. So it was yes again it was a challenge, but I, for me it was I learned a lot. It's like I never use Unity. I learned to use Unity, uh, I, and wow. was yeah. I need to understand what is performance. I need to create something in Android, so it's limited graphic. So it was crazy, but the cool thing works. And I remember uh, a meeting with the client. He. Uh, oh, they were they are very uh, happy with the uh, with experience and and I think at the point at that point we decided to use it's like okay we have this is our travel for the Nile River uh, and discover the Egypt culture and we want to uh, put this digital world into the real world. So this uh, Javier, this was idea Javier uh, to use um, 
create the, the, the boat, the oh. real boat, and put it there, and the people go there and see it in, in the boat and try to <laughs> like, discover this new world. So, cool. yes. Mm. Very nice. Yeah. That, but so I mean, trial by fire, huh? Like, like you've got, you're, you're very brave. You sort of uh, obviously work well under pressure. <laughs> yeah, I, I think. Jump in, learn. Yeah, I think I discover the way I can learn things is when, it's when I decided to do it in, in, I don't know, in two weeks. It's like, okay, I have two weeks for learn. And I remember a few months ago, I need to learn not, okay, I have two uh, weeks. I need to do it right now. So focus, 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 and watch it a lot and try to watch a lot for me. I learned watching uh, a, a, another person do it, no, like, be at the same time doing it. So it was okay. I think, yes, if I try to think about it, for me, it's like an intensive uh, workshop of a lot of software at, uh, in, in the moment. So, yes. But I love that feeling of, I don't know how I can create this so I, I like that. Okay, I have a lot of questions. I, I need to ask to somebody these questions. And I go to the website or Google, try, okay, try to understand or discover how I can create things. I think that is the way why I know a lot of software. It's because I ask a lot. It's like in in, uh, in the forum, it's like, oh, hello, I'm Paula from Chile. I, I want to do this, create this. How I can do it? and then asking a lot yeah that's the way to do it yeah <laughs> indeed <laughs> and this project this project that we're looking at right now is beautiful that was um sort of an astronomical uh, exhibit there was the sun yeah. and there were the stars was that yeah. two different projects well yeah there were th three there is the museum is meme i think in, in english museum I don't know, Mirador, <laughs> but okay. it, it's a museum specifically for interacting things here in Chile. And there, I think was three years ago, they're going to open a new building for astronomical thing, the space, the stars, all the stuff. And for me, it was, um, was a dream create a project for them. Just one. For me, it was, okay, I need to create this. Mm. <laughs> and, and they contact me. Uh, at the at the end, we create three projects. One is about to see the the sun and different uh, filters. So the cool thing we use image from NASA. So it was oh, we can use NASA <laughs> uh, <laughs> source. And the other was about compare the stars. So you can see, for example, this the sun is a star. Uh, it's in the middle of the age. It's like it's not too young and it's not too adult. So we use there. We use I think Arduino and we put um, a sensor so you can put uh, an element to the left and the right and you can compare it, the stars. Oh. And the other was discover the sky and you can discover the constellation for the Greeks or Mapuches. Uh, I don't remember the other, but. I think the Aymaras. So you can you are there with a touch screen, a little touch screen, and you can move in this amazing uh, video wall and discover the sky. Wow. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. It, 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 it must be really nice working on projects that are so interesting, right? I mean, yeah. the, sub, yeah, the, cool the thing, subject yeah, the, matter. Yeah, the cool thing, I, I learned a lot of the star, the sky, it's mm. like a lot of knowledge. Like, oh, yes, the sun is this, it's a star in the distance. Yes. And the other cool thing I remember um, for the uh, project for Compare Stars, we need to create a stars, create a 3D model. And we don't, uh, I think the, the, astr uh, the astronomer, uh, they don't have the image. It's like they think the star is like this. It's only theory. So we create the stars that we move and they are very happy. It's like, oh, we have the star like we imagine or all the data we have. It's like this. Oh, so amazing. So that is cool. Success. 
Yeah. Yeah. From one to so that's a total of three projects in the same yeah. idea, or in the same uh, in the same topics basically. Yeah. Nice. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it was nice. Yeah. Was it scary for uh, for um, at the beginning because it's like oh this is an important museum I think was the first wo uh, work or project from Brillo so it was okay and I remember uh, Javier he was uh, at, uh, in Barcelona so it was me here alone in Santiago Chile <laughs> trying to install thing it was this is not working oh, okay how can we fix this okay I don't know how I don't know. Like, uh, uh, use an encoder, okay, Google, okay, put this, this, okay, I fix it, okay, next, and yes, for me, everything is a challenge, but when, yeah, I, I learn a lot with a problem, it's like, okay, this is a problem, how we can fix it, let's go. Clearly, so we haven't talked about school of machines or um, school for poetic computation, do we have, do we have time, Marcus, should we, uh, Quickly, uh, yeah, you took part in uh, two, two of those. Uh, well, obviously, school of what are we looking at now? School of school, yeah. school of machines, machines right now. Yeah, of, yeah. Yeah. Uh, for me, uh, everything is started with the school of poetic computation because uh, I, I think I, I try to understand what I want to do in my life. What's the middle class, middle crisis? It's like what I can do, what I, I want to do. And I remember uh, try to understand code. I, I, I found Daniel Chiefman on YouTube. He was teaching trigonometry, the natural code. It was okay, this is cool. And then I discovered Sadi, Zach Lieberman. Oh, he was very cool. And then I discovered uh, the, the, that school, School for Poetic Computation, the SFPC. And then I decided to, okay, one day I'm going to be there. And first, what I need to do, I need to speak in English. At the time, I couldn't. And uh, second, I need money. And third, I need to apply. Okay. I think it took me three years for me. It's like, okay, full money, full English, English every day, and then apply. I think the hardest thing, the hardest thing was apply because I need to record myself and send a video. But I did it, and I went to spring 2018, and for me it was one of the best experience in my life because I think it changed the way I think about life. Or I don't know, it changed everything. And I met a lot of people, amazing people, friends, uh, people for, from Germany, Canada, Thailand, Italy, from, was, from Korea, was oh, a lot of people. I, I learned a lot. I, for me, I, I was for three months. I felt like I was at home. I, I don't know. I, I felt inspired for great things. And I think in that moment, I define it uh, as myself. I'm an artist. I'm a digital artist. I want to create these things. So, yes, it was amazing. And then I think uh, a year... Uh, Next uh, I, a year later, I decided to I don't know if I, I, it's like it's something is missing. So I discovered the school of machines, and then I apply, and I think the 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 workshop, uh, the name is Future Landscape, was about to create immersive technologies such virtual virtual or augmented reality within the context of landscapes, but uh, both seen and unseen. So the cool thing was, again, travel to another country, and that time was Ireland, and meet another uh, other people from other uh, countries, from Belarus, uh, and specifically in uh, Ireland. And it was it's like amazing. I think when you travel in another country and you meet people, it's like, yeah, okay. yeah. Everything is Mind blown. <laughs> amazing. And then <laughs> you, you talk, you you share knowledge. It's like, I don't know how to explain it. You, it's, it's amazing. Okay. So how it's long... like, like my... And the programs are fairly, um, you said yesterday, you said the School of Machines, it's a fairly short program. And how long is the yes, um, it's School it's of... Intensive. The, it's a school of machines, it depends of what, but they had 
they have um uh, it's my workshop was one month it's intensive it's what every day intensive all day so yes the different the different with uh, sspc was the sspc is just uh, three months it's just four four days on the week so it's different because you they have more time and the others mm -hmm. you have just one wow. month yeah, yeah. Uh, that, that that's very intensive but but yeah. you've got obviously you got so much out of it right yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so what are yeah. we going to be working on today guys well we did get a couple of questions from you paula and um jared and myself will uh try to answer a bit of that um we'll start off with something that uh yeah the looping which is I guess this comes from rendering out videos and um, trying to get that perfect loop going. Um, and uh, we'll also be looking at uh, using sound in Touch Designer, which Jared will look at, as well as some techniques for transparency um, and uh, shading. So Shiny stuff. Yeah, exactly, shiny stuff. Um, so quite a bit to look at. I'll try to make it quick in the beginning, um, to talking about uh, looping things. And i um, just gonna switch here into the touch designer window. And you had an example already, which kind of, I mean, this is kind of the, the right thing to do. How do you loop stuff? Well, um, the example you had was this fear and um, attached to it a noise, um, a noise stop. And now the noise stop is animating by default with a apps time dot second. So it's just going, the noise is just going, um, or the, the sphere is traveling through this noise field into one direction and it's then at the end of the time, oh no, it's apps time. So it never is gonna come back. It's just always going into one direction. So um, theoretically, and this was the solution that you already had there, it would be to use a pattern chop and um, define two channels for TX and TY and make this sphere go in a circle through the, uh, through the noise field. Um, so fairly simple to set up with the pattern chop TX, TY. You have a phase step per channel, so you can do a 0.25 phase step and you get the uh, um, circle and then you let it go through i don't know maybe ty and oh i had tx and ty let's do that just to keep that uh remove export tx and ty and yes it's gonna be uh, i mean it goes in a circle so it definitely comes back from where you started um it might look a little bit uniform and because you're going like circular through, so oh, this doesn't work. What am I doing? Ugh. I'm a little bit confused today, but that's okay. Um, obviously we'll have to put in something that looks up the current, uh, like uh, the sample, the right sample. I'm just exporting the whole channel here. Um, and perhaps we would use the timeline because when you're rendering out, you're most likely going to use the timeline. Um, now there's different ways to approach this. I just going to use the lookup here quickly. And, um, my index range would be the number of frames that I have in my timeline timeline. So I can say, uh, me dot, um, time dot range start and me dot time dot range end. So this is the range that I get from my lookup here, uh, from my timeline frame. And then I can plug in the, uh, uh, yeah, my circular waveform and actually animate the noise through the field. So if this is too uniform, you can always uh, do things like, um, create a noise, uh, a single noise, and now multiply the noise with the circle. So if you do that, you get kind of 
a noise that is uh, also circular again. So you get it, um, the start and the end is going to be the same. So multiply. And this you could add onto the circle itself. So another math. And uh, add those two together. And now uh, you kind of can see, okay, it's still a sine and a cosine, but a little bit um, deformed. Um, I often, because I'm never sure if it's really working or whatever is happening here. So I just use the chop to quite a bit um, to actually confirm, oh, okay, it's a perfect, or it, like the start and the end is the same. So I can plop that in here. And also now with the visualization here, it's kind of nice because you have control now over the noise, mm -hmm. like you can um, see if your amplitude or whatever. It's a little bit wonky. The, uh, you cannot control the period in here um, like this. You actually um, would have to use the transform scale parameters to kind of stretch out the noise mm -hmm. or collapse the period seemingly, or you uh, um, increase the um, um, the incoming amplitude, which is the lookup. I didn't mention this, but the first input to this noise here is basically the x, y, z sampling points. So it's going into the noise and looking at those x, y positions in the noise field and fetches that. You can add a third channel if you want for t, z, um, but yeah, I'm going to skip that here. Um, I'm going to get to that also in a little bit, but a really good tutorial I wanted to mention here is by Simon Alexander Adams, and you can find that on YouTube. And I guess we can also post that here in the chat. I'll just do that right now. Um, where he's actually explaining looping noise quite a bit and going over a couple of the things that also I'm basically showing here, like very similar ideas because here the chops i'm putting chops into a chop noise but you could also take a circle convert it to tops and use it with a noise top for example to get a similar looping um, noise there um now okay so this is fairly simple looping stuff with noise uh, it's a perfect loop the next thing is um, a little bit trickier because then you said, well, okay, so fine. Now, I, uh, what, what about particle systems? How can I loop a particle system? And um, I started with the sub particle system because I mean, generally thinking, um, we do have the option in the particle sub and that's why actually it's quite nice to use for this to um, um, control the pre-roll time and the pre-roll time is something where it pre-calculates the particle system for the number of uh, seconds that you specify here so it's pre-roll time now if you think about it this way then um, if you know that the like you can start your uh, particle system in the state that it would end in, then you have a perfect loop. So it's a function between the birth rate and the uh, life expectancy that you can, um, that you have to put in formulas a little bit, like a little bit of scripting, that make this particle system loop. So, and, um, the, the, they're actually not too, uh, too outrageous. Um, and there, there is also limitations to the whole thing, but uh, we'll get to that in a second. The main thing with the particle system to make that work is the uh, birth rate. So you have 600 frames in this example. Now, um, to keep it easy, we would say, okay, I want to go through the particle system once per loop of my timeline. So every point of my incoming geometry should spawn off uh, um, one particle 
at least. Um, Mark, can I interrupt for sure. a second? I think it's I think it'd be better if we had Paula's picture in the uh, window versus me, because uh, so Paula has to say something in order to be yes to replace me. Um, this is Skype basically <laughs> dictating who it's picking up. I have no. I have no Thank choice you, here, really. I think Paula is muted. That's fine. Paula, are you muted? Sorry, what? Oh, there we go. <laughs> no, it's OK. No, it's OK. <laughs> are you still there? <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, the, uh, uh, where was I? Oh, right, birth rate. So uh, what we need to do is we need to get the input points, which would be me dot inputs a little bit of python here zero dot num points and now we want to divide this by the number of frames for our um that we have or by the time because the birth rate is also per second so we basically want to divide this by the time of our timeline range uh, so I'm going to just put some parentheses here and going to say again me dot time dot range start uh, range end minus me dot time dot range start. Um, now this is in frames, but we have seconds here. So I'm going to also say times me dot time dot uh, rate. Good. And that gives me an error because I've got uh, capitalization is always important. OK. Um, and the other thing here, adaptive homing, I got to turn that off. And now um, uh, turn on the dots so I can see something. Uh, yeah, now I can speed this up. I can speed this up by full. Like if you um, by by integers like full multiplications, you cannot do times one point five or something. You have to do times four or times five or something. Um, and the next thing is that my life expectancy must be the same as my pre-roll time because I want to have one full uh, like from life to death basically of one of those particles here. So I can say, uh, well, what's the name of this parameter? Life expect is life. So it would be me dot par dot life for the pre-roll time. And um, to prove my point that this should be working, um, I can set the reset pulse here to reset my particle system at the last frame of my timeline me dot time dot range and no me dot time dot frame equals me dot time dot range end uh, yeah so it would jump once but now the next time it goes around and let's see how that works it should just go very fluently fingers crossed yes it just cycled um, so now that's a pretty boring particle system so far and it is questionable which of these forces you can use so we have to try a little bit if that works actually I didn't try too much uh, wind I didn't have success uh, turbulence seemed to work but one thing what we often do is we often use noise in here as well um, and let's say a normal noise to change the uh, like how these particles are being created and um, um, Greg says my loop end condition is dangerous if you skip frames that's true but you know what the uh, when you're rendering out loops you're rendering in non real time so I'm basing this all on the ideas that you're running this in non-real time. Um, yeah, otherwise we would have to th rethink this a little bit differently. So for the noise here, the noise is problematic because when you're recalc or when you're 
calculating the um, um, the pre-roll time, it's not going to calculate three seconds worth of this noise. Uh, so what we would have to do is we would actually have to uh, just stop it from moving for the first three seconds, basically. So or for the last three seconds, better, um, so that it's animating. And then the last three seconds is always the same. Mm, that's a uh, like not ideal, but that's how we could make this work. And then it starts animating again. Um, so yeah, I did that similarly here with my, um, with the same, um, with the same uh, pattern timeline. And then just in the, in the lookup, um, in the lookup shop, I just changed it to uh, go from um, dum, dum, dum. the index range is the first frame to the range end minus the uh, op particle one dot par dot life because that's also my pre-roll time right uh, times me dot time dot rate um, so you're basically now it's saying, okay, go through my go through my circle for the first uh, 420 frames, and now um, how can I make it how can I make it stop after 420 frames? Well, uh, the lookup has the option that cyclic range should be off, so I can say no to cycling, but um, now I have to look at my chop and I see that, oh, my values here are um, like it's the condition is basically uh, the extent condition is for it to loop. And I definitely don't want this, but I want this to be um, insert operator cycle. I want to hold the last value, uh, not cycle, sorry, extent. Um, insert operator extend and I'll just say hold hold here so now after 420 frames this should just stop moving yeah so it stops moving and then it starts again and this I can now reference in my uh, transform of my noise And there might be a tiny little, no, looks pretty good. Seems to be, I guess I should uh, raise this amplitude to make this more, go more crazy. Okay, that was the first one, now it should loop. Um, yeah, so this would be, uh, this would be the, uh, there is one, there is a, there's a tiny little thing here. Um, if I change the, if I add noise to this, uh, to this pattern in this instance, then these uh, start and end values, they can be um, slightly off somehow. Um, and uh, I had a different, if, if you're just using the pattern as is, then you can do the extent and uh, with a default value, extent left and extent right. And then you would say, okay, for the first channel, the default value should be zero. For the second channel, it should be minus one, the extent value. So um, zero comma minus one. It's like a little list comprehension lookup or list lookup basically in Python and then uh, me dot uh, chan index and now I have um, my extent conditions are now um, uh, definitely zero here for tx and minus one for ty otherwise they might be slightly off and you would get this little jump um, there was another bug that we just discovered then. So 
uh, it's half usable, but uh, it's kind of there. Now, with, um, with particle systems that you would create, oh, sorry, should, maybe I should ask if there's any question. Greg says I'm cheating. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, let me know if there's any, or if you have questions. Paula, I'm, I'm happy to elaborate on these. Um, yeah, so anything basically that you do before going into the particle system would have to stop three sec or um, the lifetime of a particle before the end of your loop. Uh, similarly, you are restricted. You cannot use um, <clears throat> life variants that would break the system because now particles would live longer or shorter and then uh, be a suddenly born. So it comes with, it comes with issues. Um, for, for top based particle systems. And, uh, I do have a bigger example, but, uh, I think I'm just going to skip because of, um, time. Um, theoretically it's the idea of controlling your part, like knowing what your particles will do. So you have to build the system such that you describe the particle movement itself, which in its simplest way is literally just thinking of it as every particle has a direct position as if I'm looking at it with a noise, like with a 32-bit noise. Um, and now uh, using using tops to basically manipulate these positions for each of these points from its starting position to somehow make it back to its um, originating point. And um, ideas for this would be again have every particle go in a circle and then start offsetting those circle positions, like thinking, oh, how can I now um, deform these circle positions a bit more? But uh, that's uh, fairly big examples, um, but good. Um, and I, right, so in the, in the general term of looping, I also meant to uh, point to this, um, to this tutorial by, can I actually switch here? Let me see. Um, why should I just do this here? There's another tutorial here by uh, Stas, and now I forgot his last name again. Um, you can find it on yes. YouTube, though. Stas uh, no. Tamara and, uh, has a Patreon as well. And he also has a Patreon, yeah, that's right. Um, and he has this perfect loops and touch designer where he takes a, um, a general it's, it's a really nice tutorial where he takes a general idea, which is controlled with beats and with um, pulses and who knows what LFOs. And then he converts it into something that can be, that's completely looped, loopable. So it's a good um, real life uh, example of that. Um, on this topic of looping though, I also wanted to mention a little bit uh, because we're talking a lot about noise and how to loop noise. Um, and somebody who worked on this quite a bit as well is um, David Brown, who has a tutorial, which I'll post here as, way, as well, looping tiling noise tutorials. Um, and I'll uh, just quickly get into what the idea there is and how that expands. You basically do this on tops and in a 1D example here, you get, uh, you'll take a ramp as a lookup into your noise. And uh, yeah, let's take a noise here. So the first input would be, would be just used to uh, create the uh, right resolution. Um, by default, the output of the noise top has input plus noise, but in this case, I just want to create noise. And the second input here is the lookup into 
um, is the lookup into the noise field again, the um, yeah, noise coordinate map. So I have the first one, which is going from through the noise map from zero to one. And my second one now, I want this to, the end result should be a noise that is basically the same in the beginning and in the end. So basically I want to look from minus one to zero and zero to one. And then if I flip the minus one to zero and this, uh, no, if I then move the minus one to zero over the um, one to zero, minus one to, over the zero to one, I now have the zero points basically at the end of this noise, if that makes sense, and it's looping around. Nobody can see me gesturing here. I just gestured this out perfectly in pantomime, but yeah. uh, anyway. Marcus, Marcus why, why can't we see you in that little square? Oh, because Skype and... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I have problems. a question Yeah. about the soul, the, the first... The, par the particle, this first one. Yep. What happened with a, a tractor? Because, yeah. Um, Particles, it's school, I can do it in loop, but I can do a loop with a tractor within the particles? Um, with force, um, those are all very difficult, but it, okay. if you're not animating it, that should work. Yeah. I only had trouble somehow with wind. I don't know why, actually. But um, turbulence seemed to work, and this would indicate to me that with turbulence working, that I can use external forces, I hope. Um, yeah, surface attractors I haven't tried either, because that means that it's going towards the surface, but that should be fine as well, I think. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. I mean, if I take a circle here. Dum, dum. Let's just let's run it through. Ah, there's a tiny jump, which might be still from this noise here. So let's try without the noise and. No, it jumps. So surface attractor, no. Um, I would hope that you can actually make use of the forces properly. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, da -dum. All right, I quickly continue here. Oh, look, we should switch to teams apparently. Um, anyway. Um, so, to create this 1D lookup, um, you basically just subtract one from this whole thing and uh, one from the incoming noise map. And now we can create uh, with a matter top, we can blend between these two noises and use the third input as our. Um, as our blend map on the red channel. And if I look at this now with uh, top to chop and increase the, all of these parameters of these two noises would now have to be, have to get the same um, parameters generally. Oh, and I should switch the inputs here. And now this looks like a matching noise. And if I tile this or if I um, scale this um, and tile it with repeat, dum, 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 I should not see any like sudden jumps. It's actually creating a tileable noise. So the same thing works for um, 2D noises, like for full, this is a one-dimensional, but it works with two-dimensional as well, where now you would need a total of um, four noises to do this and uh, some more multiplication, but it's really nice to see this in 
David Brown's tutorial that I posted in the chat here. <clears throat> he goes through this. He also goes through another one, which is then time looped uh, noises as well. Um, and I think it's all available on his uh, GitHub as well. So um, ASMR videos with Marcus. Wait, what's ASMR? Oh, my mouse is clicking too much. Sorry. Oh, terrible. I need a silent mouse. Um, Owen, Owen really likes the sound of your mouse. So okay. I think we'll go with we like the Good. sound. It's <laughs> and uh, I think the last thing I'll show, oh no, two things, two things and then Jared is up. Um, one more thing is uh, creating spherical noises. Um, so spherical noises would be again the same idea that you take a UV lookup map and put it into uh, the second input of the noise and now you can create a noise that is actually um, perfectly rotational. Like you can transform the input map through this noise field as well. Um, and you can create these spherical um, UV maps by doing some top math as well. Might be a simpler, you probably can do this simpler in a shader, but I enjoy tops too much. Too, so I can just do it in here. And it basically it creates a very um, a nice sphere. Uh, one problem is that you get a lot of points in the, top, in the two pole caps, um, but oh well, nobody will see that. Um, so this is really useful when you're doing, yeah, when you need a spherical uh, noise map for your uh, top pace, based particle system or if you um, yeah if you're rendering something for 360 and you want to do post effects on 360 like displacement maps or something like this uh, on 360 content <clears throat> then this comes in really handy um, that's this one Oh, and the other chop, and I wanted to point out a chop, also a David Brown one that was added uh, not too long ago to Touch Designer, which helps, I think it helps with um, creating these animations for um, creating loopable animations as well, because it gives you a little bit variance in your looping. And this is the phaser, the phaser chop. So by default, the system here, what we're looking at here, and this is straight off the example from David Brown's um, phaser workshop in, um, in Berlin. Um, what we're looking at here is two uh, SOPs, or basically it's, uh, it's a box with some grid lines in there. So you can set, when you have a box, you can add divisions to it and then the box is rotated 90 degrees around the z-axis and then he's using a blend chop to blend between these two um, these two geometries and then instancing it together now with points just using um, or i'm using point sprites here to uh, uh, instance this as a particle system essentially if you blend from uh, with a straight like with a straight cross blend, then this animation would look very uh, uniform and not as interesting as what you can get here. And this is the uh, achievement of the phaser chop where you go from zero to one and all the values here that the phaser chop outputs go from zero to one as well. But it has the second input, which is the phase and the phase between, um, should be between zero and one uh, this should be limited clamp um, dictates how quickly these uh, go up or like re go from zero to one. So you can really direct nicely um, how quickly uh, values are rising. And then you have your zero to one ramp, which is uh, nicely controlled for each separate sample and this can control the blend and make this transition quite interesting. Again, I would point to David Brown's uh, workshop for that um, 
that was he I think he gave that at the Berlin summit um, to see more examples but I think it's really a good one for looping stuff because it has this it just gives more variance to um, animating loops okay I have another question it's technical maybe simple you can okay I know you can instance with a chop or a, a top yep. what is better someone sent me the top because Mm. Is any much different or a top for performance what is better or if we if, for example if I need to create something is you prefer some, the top or the chop or it's okay I think it's context what, what you what your data is in um, I mean uh, tops are nice because it's all on the GPU and it stays on the GPU because the um, um, the instancing is done on the GPU as well but uh, not everything is easily doable on the GPU. I mean, um, in David Brown's workshop, there is actually also, he has the phaser chop as a shader in there as well. So then you could perhaps do the same thing here, convert it to tops and do it there. Um, but I think it's always context and what, which data you okay. can work better with. I mean, if you're doing particle systems where you have um, a million um, or over a million or whatever uh, pixels because you're doing uh, 1024 by 1024 or something like this, then certainly it's easier with tops in general than working with chops because then the chop drawing would probably uh, decrease your performance quite a bit. But um, otherwise, I like chops as well. You can also okay. use sops and dots, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, every operator. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. All right. Um, Jared, are you there? Jared's on deck. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello. 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 Um, okay, so. Um, I'll connect to you. Oh, right, right, right. You gotta buzz in here. Hello, everybody. Let's see if there's any questions while you do that. Uh, no. All right. I am noticing a dropout locally here every for four seconds. So if I do pause, just let me know, and I'll pause for four seconds until it comes back. Hopefully it won't happen. Um, okay, so uh, Paula had some a beautiful question based on these two images. Um, and her question was, how do I get transparency like this? And uh, my stomach fell to the floor. I, was, I panicked. Not possible. But, um, but it, it's possible to a certain extent. Uh, these images... Paula, I, I, I believe you made these in Cinema 40? Uh, this I found it. Oh, you found uh, I think them? Yes, I found it. I think okay. it's uh, these yes, cinema, maybe. Glass. Yeah, no. I don't, they look like uh, Julie, the glass blowing artist. I'm not sure. Yeah, something like that. May, maybe it's Red Chief or, or Octan, I think so. Okay, yeah. Um, so we, obviously we can't ray trace, um, but we do, but as you know. Sorry. Jared, can you move the Skype window from the... Um, oh, over here? Yeah. Thank you. No problem. Yeah, so... Um, but we have pretty clear transparency issues in real time. Um, and so I'm going to walk through what those issues are. And then also give some strategies on how to make something look like this, kind of. Um, and so, so we'll, we'll, we'll work through that now. Um, so first of all, um, maybe the right way to start is to start with a with a um, sphere saw. And uh, by default, if you just grab a sphere saw and then a texture and um, throw it into a geo object, put down a material, put the Moving on to the color map, make it constant, and I'll zero these out. So 
vote <clears throat> make this the material. Oops. So we won't get transparency right away. Um, obviously, there's no, there's no alpha set up on this. But then if I go and say, for example, make this more transparent, um, doesn't look very transparent yet, just got darker. That's because on the Fong material, you need to turn on blending. Um, however, when you turn on blending, it doesn't look so good. It's all kind of, sometimes it's opaque, you rotate to the front, it's, it's uh, translucent. So this is where people get stuck right away. Um, and the reason for this is in like regular 3D packages with offline renderers, not real-time renderers, they, one of the first steps when the render pipeline is, um, is passing the image or the geometry data to the render engine is, um, is it gets sorted. All the geometry in the scene gets sorted from the distance from the camera back. Um, and that's not possible on the GPU. Um, however, there are some features coming out with Vulkan that is going to make that easier. But um, uh, so things should get better in the future. But these are the sort of things that you can do to work around that for now. Um, so uh, let's set up a render so this is easier to see. And um, put this in the background. So uh, when I rotate this again, it doesn't look right. So it, what we can do, though, is we can sort the uh, primitives from, from the camera's position. Um, and we can do that with a sort, um, a sort saw. And in the primitive page, there's an option for sorting primitives by distance to object. And then you can drag your camera into there. Um, and then we're going to have to troubleshoot this, and I'll just do it with you as we go here. So first of all, did that help? So we would go back to our component and rotate it. Well, we can't rotate at the component level because we want to sort, we want to rotate before the sort. And so we have to do the, the, the transform at this level. So this is going to be much more heavy. So this is, instead of moving one uh, transform, uh, we're going to be moving one transform for every point in the geometry. So the more points you have in this, the more unrealistic this is going to have to be for real time. But it's still valid for getting a nice transparent scene set up that's maybe not static. Like, for example, this is just a still image. So you could kind of get close if you had all of these polygons sorted properly. So, um, so I, if I rotate now, we still have a problem. And that's because if we middle click on the sphere, we'll see that the mesh, it's a mesh by default. And a mesh is really one primitive. So it can't sort one primitive. Um, so we need to convert, or not convert, but we need to, um, well, we could convert it to triangles. Um, but we can also just generate a polygon uh, uh, system here, and then topology, and then go to the, sorry, and then go to the detail page and increase the frequency. And uh, we're kind of better. I'm, I'm going to rotate here. But we see some weirdness on the edges, and I'm wondering why. But it's probably because this geo object was transformed before when I was transforming it. So if we set this to zero, then the, the incoming geometry is in the same state. You'd want your transform for your geo object to be zero and your camera object to be facing it. And then in that sense, then all the surface operators are passing into the geo objects are properly um, in the right order from the camera. And then when we rotate, it looks transparent. No, it doesn't. <laughs> so we're still not there. And the reason for that is you have to reverse the order. So this is a little tricky. So once you reverse the primitive order, whoops, that's random. Um, now it looks nicely transparent. So if I go back to the transform and rotate, this will be pleasingly transparent. Okay. And so the good news with that as well is it doesn't have to be a sphere, which is kind of cheating. And we're going to be doing a little cheating. I'll say that in advance before Greg calls me up. Um, 
with spheres today, but um, but we're trying. I'm not. I'm trying not to cheat too much. So this is in this example, we're not cheating at all. So this is a zero cheat level, which is you can pass a torus in as well and uh, rotate around the torus, and it looks. It should look good. Why is that not working? My goodness. Sort distance object. Reverse. Okay, well, that should work, and I'm not going to get hung up on that. Um, hmm. Okay. But anyway, um, polygon sorting should always work. Where's the render setup? You might want to change the type of the. Oh, it's not playing forward, maybe? No, the primitive type of the torus. Oh, I'm sorry. Again, see, you get hoisted all the time. This has to be polygon. Yeah, so that was the mesh again. Thank you, Marcus. Save the day. And now if we rotate, we get a clean transparency. So yeah, you have to keep telling yourself, I know this works. Um, why? Look back at your topology. Is your is your scale inverted? Like it could it could be so many different things that kind of mess you up. Um, so everything kind of has to be kosher. All the polygons need to be sorted to the, to the camera and then reversed. So you need both sorts. And then you're good. Um, so with that in mind, um, let's try to um, let's try to go after um, this guy here. Um, so So again, we're, I'm going to start, well, I'm going to use a sphere in this case, but we can also use a torus in this method at the end. Um, so I'm going to start with a, um, well, in this case, I'm going to use a mesh. And so I, and I'm going to show you a different technique that doesn't require polygon sorting, that um, you can use the render top to, um, to, to kind of allow you to, to send the back faces out, front faces, and allow you to compose a final transparent object by working with front faces, back faces, and also a feature called independent um, transparency. Uh, uh, independent sort of, yeah, whatever it's called. I'll just tell you in a sec. So, um, so yeah, so if we start with a sphere and then uh, we get a render top, and then, um, and then grab a material. Then there's these, this really interesting new system. Um, you can render a SOP directly into a render top by, rep by just putting the SOP into the geometry area. So it doesn't need to be a geo object. Notice this isn't a geo object, it's just a regular old sphere. <clears throat> um, but if you want it to render, you're going to need it to have the render flag on. And you're also going to need a camera. And um, we can, and so the idea here is very similar to what Marcus was doing, where he was generating um, a, uh, a a position um, map, a map in 2D of all the of all the 3D positions, and then you can use that to um, to generate a coherent three-dimensional noise on an object on a 3D object. Right, so um, uh, so how do we get that 3D position data? Uh, how do we get that? How do we generate that texture? So um, we can just go to the Fong material. Well, first of all, we want to. The first thing we want to do is want to unwrap um, the the geometry in the render top using the UV unwrap mode, and you won't see anything happen yet. Um, but if you go into the Fong material, which should be um, assigned to the render top itself, so this is a material that is now assigned to this, then you can go to the advanced page and you can tell, you can add a color buffer to this material. So you can say, I want to send into color buffer one the world space position. And then, um, and then, and then, if in the in in here, you can add another color buffer in the render top. 
They have two color buffers. So now there's a there's a secret color buffer in there. If you use the render select and grab this guy and get color buffer one, then you get the position data out of this geometry. Okay. So um, so that and you'll see that that's quite. It looks exactly like um, Marcus's. Uh, Handmade, uh, ramped, generated uh, system. So, but it, again, if we change this to a torus, for example, torus, then it's going to be different. Uh, hmm. Torus. Geometry. Oh, render flag. Render. And yeah. yeah, don't forget the render flag. So it's a little confusing because you can. it's easy to get tripped up. But you have to have your render flag on. You have to have the material set up with this extra thing. And you'll see that you can also send other stuff like the normals off of it, uh, camera space position. So you get all kinds of cool features with this. Um, so pretty neat. OK. So let's go back to world space position on the material. Greg is asking if you could change the <clears throat> uh, render select view to look at it as points, just as a. Okay, say, say it again, sorry. Um, if you could um, change the render select viewer to view as points, just to make a, um, the render select. Uh -huh. If you go to the render sure. select. View as points, let's see what happens here. So. Oh, render select, yeah. So nothing in the render, but in the render select, we'll see. Um, oh, you need to do 32-bit. Oh, yeah, bit. but then it would have to be. Oh, yeah, so so thank you for mentioning that. So as now that we're working with, now we're, that we're working with um, just 3D data, like in this case position, um, the render top has to be set to 32-bit, another very common mistake. So set that to 32-bit, and Greg's right. Now we've got um, a uh, torus. And so that torus looks like this. Um, here's an image in 2D. OK, so now we're kind of set up to have some, some fun. Um, I'm going to change this back to sphere. Render sphere. OK. All right, so um, let's get this sphere rendering into um, a different render. So this is a whole system that should be sort of put off to the side, because it's really just getting us this uh, texture map that we can use to drive a procedural noise texture that we're going to texture map this sphere with. But before we do that, we're going to want to render, set up a render, just a basic render for this. So we'll get a geo here. And we'll call this uh, uh, main blast. And then um, we're faking this. So we're going to call this um, uh, 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 volume, which is totally not a volume, but I'm cheating here. Volume glass. <clears throat> And uh, then we want to create a, um, and I'm going to, you could do this with PBR, which is really fun. Actually, I'm going to, I'm going to do PBR, but I'm not going to get too deep on the PBR part of it because we will run out of time. Um, so we've got need two PBR um, shaders. And just to keep, make things quick, I'm going to grab my environment light. And uh, let's get these guys set up. So. Need a material on you. I need a material. Whoops. You. Okay. So um, those guys are rendering good. Now we just need to set up a render. So render camera. And I'm just going to work. I'm not going to work with uh, too much lighting. So I don't really need a light other than the environment light for now. Actually, no, no, I do want one light. But, and it's actually one thing I do a lot is uh, just because a d distant light's easy to manage because it's just a distant light. It's like just casting sunlight into your system, kind of. 
and it's easy to pick a orientation for it. Just it can be at zero zero, and you can just rotate, get some light going. So, um, so there you go. And we don't want to render. So as well, you can start to step on yourself right now in your render because we've got all this other stuff going on. So let's get these guys only rendering in this new render with um, uh, star.glass. Okay. All right, so now we should see a sphere. And if we go up to our directional light and just max it out, okay, we've got, we've got a sphere. So, so ultimately, the, the goal here is we want this to kind of start to get um, to look kind of like cool with the noise pattern. So we can use this procedural noise to, or procedural, these positions to generate some procedural noise. So one thing we noticed, and everyone beware, if you're going to use this method, the way that it works is it goes out to the ver ver vertices in the 3D scene, it grabs the position and then it prints it into this texture. And there is a edge problem, which in the case of a sphere can be fixed because we can fake it. Um, but not all geometry will have this fix. So be aware there might be seams and hopefully we'll come up with a solution for that. Um, but there is a serious technical hurdle to that, fixing it completely. But this is the fix. <laughs> um, and the fix is you crop the right side off. And by the way, Aki, Yamashita was over for lunch yesterday. She figured this out. Thank you, Aki. So you crop the right side out, and then you uh, flip it in um, flip it in X, and then you uh, you then you inverse the, the blue channel, and then you put it over on the left side, and blammo, it's gone. Now this is perfect. Okay. So um, now we can take this. Uh, spherical noise or spherical positions, and we can put it into a noise, um, a noise uh, top. And so this is whatever. It's just settings that uh, I kind of tweaked around or whatever. I also made the resolution of this because it's equi rectangular in this case. I made it two by one, so it's 4K by 2K. Um, and then uh, from there, you can. It never hurts to add another noise. <laughs> so if this is spatially correct because it's driven in by the second input, you can do it again. And you can keep doing it, and your noise can get more and more complicated. So that's just a general trick. You can go noise to noise to noise to noise. Um, and then uh, then it's then we really just need to color this noise. And you can see that this is already you know, kind of noisy, like this pattern in, in a its own way or whatever. But we want to get the colors of that image onto the noise. And so what we can do is uh, put a ramp. So it's a ramp. And that's just a regular old ramp with some, um, I do. So the one thing I did notice with this is that there was like a little bit of a spectral, like blue to uh, red spectrum, violet in there. And so a really quick, easy thing to do um, is to uh, take uh, uh, in, go into the uh, ramp mode here and set all of the, the, the keys in the ramp to be 0 uh, in green and 0 in blue and 1 in red. Uh, so you get a red channel. And then, you get, uh, and then for the inner ones, you do red at 0 and then Green at one and blue at one, and so what you end up is that. And if you look at, if you think about that in HSV, you have a ramp in H, which is R in this case, and then you have saturation value set to one. So if you convert this to um, from uh, HSV to RGB, you get uh, a spectrum like that. So that's what gives us something more like that. Um, and so we. We, we have our color now, and so we want to have our transparency, right? So do the same thing. Um, just grab uh, 
a ramp. And I'm doing 2D ramp as well. You'll notice I'm not just making it a, a, a 1D ramp. Um, it's it's circular. And that way, and that therefore in the lookup shop, just remember if you want to do 2D lookup, um, by default, these are set to you. If I just reset this, uh, reset all parameters, it's set up, the, the lookup top is by default set up um, with the 0 0.5, 0 0.5 here, which kind of like takes out the lookup. So if you go zero to one here, then you get um, a lookup of this circle. Um, it just, it's not gonna look that much, or like, it'd be hard to tell, but at any rate, um, it might give it a little bit more dynamics. So um, then, uh, we can, now we have essentially two outputs, whoops. Uh, just make sure I'm in trouble. Yeah, so now we have essentially two outputs. We have an alpha output. No. And this is alpha. And we have a RGB. Okay, anyway, so um, yeah, that's probably good enough. So I have some other stuff there, but I don't think it's necessary. So let's attach um, the the RGB to, and I, I said it, I'm just gonna try to keep this simple. So um, I'm just gonna do emit, I think, on, um, on the color one, emit. Okay, right, right, right. Okay, right. Sorry, I was getting confused there. Um, right, yeah, emit. So on the PBR shader here, I'm going to use the emit map for RGB. And that's just because I didn't want to get bogged down in lighting. But if you follow this technique, and you can do this for, for metal and for metallic, for roughness, all of them, you're going to get a more and more richer dynamic system with environment light. So you can get really, really fancy with it. But, um, and then uh, as well on the same, on the RGB shader, you want to also apply alpha. So um, the alpha map goes here. Okay, so we should just have an emit applied for emit RGB and alpha. And um, we want to set our emit to one. Okay, and let's see if we can get that rendering at least. Okay, there we go. Okay, so um, now we have to think back to the, uh, to the original stuff, which was, uh, what do we need for, for alpha blending, right? So we need, uh, uh, we, need our, we need blending transparency on. So let's do that, okay? And so now you'll see that we have some transparency going on. But it might be a little bit messy. This is a mesh. Okay, so remember meshes were trouble. Um, so uh, meshes were trouble because they're one primitive, and uh, and so we can't sort them. We can't sort this, and we want to rotate. The ultimate goal of this is we want to rotate this like a planet, right? So um, so yeah. So we want to rotate this like a planet. So we we we, we can't use that technique. So I'm gonna um, I'm gonna rotate this just so we can see the mess that we have. So you can see it's very difficult to read. Eventually, it occludes itself, right? So problem. Okay. So uh, so what are we gonna do? So well, one thing we can do right away is we can say um, I want to call off my um, my my back faces. Okay, so now if I rotate this, um, I don't, no problem, right? It looks clean, right? But it's just the front of the sphere. It's just everything facing, it's all the front faces. Um, if they're still transparent, but you can't tell. Um, if I put it into, like, for example, transform. Um, and I should probably have my grid on, but I hate the grid. 
Um, I this. You'll see it's transparent, right? So, but what we can do as well now is we can do a separate pass, a new pass. And uh, again, we have to be sure that we're only rendering the star dot glass. And in this case, we can um, we can come here and render only the uh, back faces or call face front faces. Okay, so our oh, call face I did call face back faces. Face, faces. Why does that look different? I think that's right. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So let's take a look at these together. Does that make sense? No, that looks the same. What's going on? Um, it's the color, like clear color buffer thing on uh, the render pass. Sir. So yeah, this is so many things. Um, yeah, so you got to clear the color buffer before you render pass. So, um, so yeah, so that's it. So you have to. So this is happening in the same render pipeline. A render pass has to receive a render. This is rendering. This is the render pass that goes once, and then it takes all that geometry data, passes it to the render pass, um, and then you can pass along the same render if you want, and then do more stuff to it. But in this case, we want to get rid of all that stuff from the butt, and then just we only want to render the, the back. So these are the back faces. So this is the back side of the sphere. So we've got the front side of the sphere and the back side of the sphere separated now. Wonderful. So if we do an over of these, then we've got ourselves uh, transparency, I hope. So the front face would go over the back face. Um, and then um, it looks somewhat coherent, but it's still kind of flat and it's not really reading like like this, like your pretty guy here is. So, um, so, but the nice thing is we can fake, now that we're in the compositor, like you can kind of start to think more like, like, a, like a compositor. So um, what can we do here? So, uh, so one, one idea was, um, was to take, was to do another pass, but just to kind of give it a volume and a, and a sort of specular glow to it, like as if it, like the, like as if it's a marble, and um, and so you can add another render pass, and this time render the um, just the volume. Actually, we don't even want the volume glass here. Sorry, we only want the main glass in the render. This is the main glass render. This is also a main glass render. And then this is um, going to be the volume glass. And then clear our, clear our camera buffer. We want to. We don't care about calling our faces. Um, or no, we just want to do the front face. And this is totally. This is now just an artistic decision, but um, and we want the PBR to be. Make sure that's on PBR there. Clear. Oh, clear. Yes, we want clear. And then we want to make sure our render flag is on for volume glass. And now we should have. Now we've got just a bare bones PBR shader that's like barely being lit, right? So now we can start to think of how we want to fill the volume. So if we, if we look at like like there's some light coming from the top, maybe like maybe there's some violet light, violet light, and some blue light at the bottom, then you can start to use uh, directional lights. So let's just let's just blast this out now uh, and make this like maybe a little bit violet, <clears throat> whatever. And then uh, so and we're just what we're watching this guy here, right? So let's turn off. This. We just want to make this look like a glass ball. So you can come here and uh, you can decrease the roughness. And uh, then you can move the directional light. And this is why I like directional lights, just for PBR, really basic PBR, is you can kind of just go like that. Um, and then 
bring down the light intensity. That looks fine. And then I'll do a blue light from the top. So, and let's rotate that really quick. Fine, happy with that, okay? So now you can composite these guys together. So um, what are we gonna do? We just have to think about our order. Um, we can do the over of the glass ball over the um, the, uh, the the volume, and then um, and then we can and then we can put this over the render pass or the um, back face. Okay, and we don't see anything, and that's because. We don't have any transparency on our um, on our uh, on our PBR shader here. So let's turn on transparency, and um, and then we'll do transparency there. And now we've got a nice control of of that. So it's getting better, um, but we can do more. Uh, for example. Now you're kind of free. Now you've got a system that's kind of coherent. So let's just get this organized nicely so we can see our glass render. So now we can do something like we can put a glow into the outer path as if it's going to glow on the outside. Um, and so let's see how this goes. Or, so gloom. So there's a, a cool effect uh, made by Keith Ostraco. Nice enough to give us it for the palette in the palette under image filters. There's bloom, um, and so I, it's it's it can be kind of tricky to get going exactly the way you want it. But um, so I have it kind of preset up. Um, so yeah, now we've got a little bit of a glow. So if you put that into the top, and now look at it, now we're getting cooler. So now what we can do is rotate. So it's cool because now you can rotate this guy, and it's not rotating all the points. Um, and so that's really fast and for sure, and volumetric. Um, is there anything worth mentioning other than? Yeah, so what's nice though is now that that's all kind of tooled in, your fun is located here. So you can go back to your noise here and you can um, really change the look of it. So um, I think. I think that's all. I mean, I had other things, but it's just compositing at that point. You know, put in, like, like for example, uh, for the backside, like, you can just intervene on how you want it to look like glass. Like, you could say, uh, you could put an HSV in here and say, I want it, like, maybe it's not so saturated as it passes through, and you could, like, kill the saturation, and, like, and maybe, like, um, another great operator is Open Color I.O., um, which is here, and on this on the CDL page, there's um, a color correction toolkit, uh, which is amazing, um, which allows you to, for example, increase the slope of the RGB. So if I wanted to be more blue in the background there, I can do that. I can bring up the level of blue to make it look like like it's underwater or whatever, and so on. So um, so yeah, so there's a lot of flexibility there. Um, oh yeah, and then the final thing is like you can just as proof that well no this is a, sort of a tail of concern here. So uh, if I if I use a net so, so if we switch to torus, let's see if this how this works because there's one thing I haven't shown yet. Um, no, and if we switch this to torus. And we have to make sure that we switch our render as well. So I'll connect this to 
the null, and then we have to make sure our render flag is correct. Turn off the render flag for that. Turn off. Okay. Um, yeah, it looks pretty good. Uh, we have to increase the solution. But it's not going to be perfect because um, we're going to have artifacts potentially in different locations. It's, it's not bad, though. Like, you'll see there's a wrap there. Um, so it's not perfect in the case of... Uh, so, so you might have to fight, if you follow this technique, you might have to fight your seams, your seams, but I'm pretty confident you could follow this and then like with a, if you had a geometry that looked like this, you could probably work your way through it, you know, um, and move around it a bit. It's not gonna necessarily be perfect, but it's a, it's a decent cheat. Um, okay, so back to sphere. That's transparency. All right, so the next question was um, uh, about audio, working with audio, right? Just, yes. a, just a little time check for you, Jared. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it's uh, about a quarter to six. Uh, okay, so how much time is that? Time. Like 15 minutes. <laughs> okay. So I'm not going to build this with you. I'm just going to show you show you this, and then I'll post it um, mm -hmm. so you can kind of get into it. Um, yeah. So really, there's two there's two really main primitives. There's more, but um, but for, in touch, like the two go to uh, primitives for audio analysis are the audio waveform itself, which when you load in an audio uh, file. Um, the audio waveform is the amplitude of the waveform, right? Um, and uh, if you put, and so what you're always doing is you're, you're, you're taking your audio data and you're trailing it and you're analyzing it and looking at it artistically as what, what can you have it drive, right? So the most obvious thing that you could do with this is, is take an audio envelope of that, um, And uh, if I put this into, oh, sorry, don't take an audio envelope with that. Audio envelope with that, and then trail this. And uh, you'll see it's, t in this case, it's taking the peaks um, of the, or the envelope of the audio waveform. So that, that's like sort of 101 or pre-101 basic audio analysis, right? So you can use this to drive things. You're going to create a, a lot of craziness, and it's not going to be maybe that cool. But um, the next thing you can do is uh, you can use the audio spectrum. And the audio spectrum chop um, is, so this is a really cool component, which Greg posted uh, a while ago, not that long ago, called the graph plot. And it's, and it's, it's for plotting all kinds of data, but he helped me today plot the spectrum, um, the, the, the spectrum of the audio signal here. So, and this is the backbone of all, a lot of the things that, that I, at least I do with audio, with audio, um, driving visuals with audio. And, uh, and so what you have here is the frequency domain here, which is like from, in this case, 13 hertz to 13,000 hertz. Um, and that's what the, the, the um, and if that's what it can, the, the spectrum chop can, um, will give you a magnitude for every frequency. So, so in this case, like we can see the highest frequency or the most magnitude in this is around like 60 Hertz or so, which is the kick drum in this audio track, right? So, um, it's kind of difficult without listening to audio, but we don't have audio. So. At any rate, I can kind of turn it up here, I guess. But, um, yeah. <clears throat> At any rate, so the audio signal is passed into the audio spectrum chop. And so um, the vanilla version of the audio spectrum chop looks like this. Audio spectrum. It looks like this. And so let's just 
talk real quick about the audio spectrum. This is really critically important if you want to know, understand how to work with audio and touch designer and jet drive visuals with it. Um, so let's take a look at these settings. First of all, it's set to vis visualization for your purposes and for the 15, for the sake of 15 minutes. Um, that's the one, just leave it on that mode. And this has been, this has been dialed in using, um, uh, a, a way of distributing the, the frequencies uh, samples along this window of frequency domain uh, to make it more visually appealing. Um, and because if we look at it in the in the uh, other method, uh, it's not as interesting. So uh, as well, and this is also very important to understand, um, the FFT size is the chunk that you're going to of, of of samples that you're going to use. To, um, to look at for the frequency, um, to, to, to create a bucket of samples for, for, for a frequency range. So um, if you do 64, you're only creating 64 buckets of frequency. So you're gonna have less frequency information, okay? It's also easier to compute. So if, you, if, that, if that's all you need, then it's better to use a, 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 six, a, a FFT size of only 64 um, uh, uh, si uh, samples, I think. Yeah, is it samples? That's the question. Greg will answer that. Um, and then uh, as we go up, you'll see we get more and more um, information. And so this is because we're having more, we have more and more buckets to put our, uh, our sample information into. And so it gets uh, more and more detailed as we get higher. So, however, it can be confusing because you say I have more buckets, but um, but I, it's always the same length. Because if we look here, there's 735 samples being brought in it into touch every frame, because we're running at 60 frames per second. And actually, that's not even true. It's just because we're running at 44,100. No, that's true. We're running at 44,100 hertz. And therefore, at over 60, second, 60 uh, samples per, per second, we're going to bring in 735 samples. So, um, so if we look here, there's 22,000 samples available. Um, and that can be confusing because you would imagine this would be connected to the bucket size. But what you can do, which is e easy, it's easier to think about this, is you can set the, set, you can set the length manually. And you can go to FFT size, copy this to the set output length and place reference. But actually, it's not that simple because um, it's actually a menu object. And so I'm going to grab my, oh, I won't be able to grab it because it's not here. OK, I think it's just this. It's no big deal. Copy parameter, paste reference. It's a menu, so you're, you're not getting 64 back, you're getting, but if you do this, which is um, menu names, and do uh, the index of this, so this will give us back a number. Okay, so now, uh, for, right. yes, oh, and I'm probably going to int it. Nope. I put length 128. Oh, it had to cook. Cook problem. Okay. So, um, so, so what this what this is doing is now we've got a very specific set of frequencies here. So, like, um, the, all of these are one to one. So we have as many many frequencies in this spectrum as we have data. Oh, is Jared's back. Oh, did I cut out? Sorry. Okay, so the reason why I'm showing you this visualization settings here is because by default the spectrum is going to come out at 22,000 frames. So if you want to convert all of your frequency information into a texture, you have 22,000 of them, and most of that data is is not useful, right? So this is a way to compress down 
the um, number of samples to be very specifically the number of FFTs that you have. So if I have 1024 FFTs, I have, I, I have exactly that number, right? Otherwise, it's going to be interpolating across. Um, and so you just have more samples than are required. So, um, so this, once we set that up, we can, we can go into, um, uh, uh, we can convert it to, to a chop. So you go audio spectrum out to a chop. And then, um, then you can go uh, from there. You can, yeah, it's easier if I was to show you this step by step. And this is online. There's all kinds of people who have shown this. Um, but this is the um, this is this waveform here um, in in pixel form. And so you could create this feedback loop thing, which you've seen before, probably the spectrum the spectrum domain stuff like this, right? You can look that up. There's a million examples of that online as well. I'll save it, this file. This, this. And so all this is is the first row is the spectrum from a second ago or however many um, uh, uh, steps away we ad, as determined by 60. So this is 60 steps down. So that every so this is one second window of audio spectrum. OK? So um, I. I'm running out of time, so I'm going to really quickly show. I think there's people out there that would care about this, so I'm going to really quickly glaze over. How do we make this? This is kind of, it can be troublesome to set up. You always have to do it over and over again. And the most important thing in my mind for, um, uh, for uh, breaking out an audio track for an audio, like very specific, like you making your own audio for a show or for a, 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 a piece online or whatever, is you don't want to work with just one audio file. You don't want just the stereo track. You want all the stems from the from the mixer, from the Ableton Live tracks. You want all those baked out at the same length, all separate tracks. Okay, so um, let's take a look at what that can look like. And so I've been work. I've been making it this packing system, um, which has worked out really well for me. Um, so in this case, we have audio for. Um, uh, a track, and they're all the individual stems. You've got the kick, the stairs, the hi hats, and so on. So, and it's just, they're all stereo too. So that's a lot of audio data, right? Um, and so, uh, you don't necessarily always want this playing live in your system because it, you you just want the data from it, and you want it just tossed aside and be done with it. So I'm gonna make sure that this file is available for download for you guys. Um, but so what the system does is it it gives you it takes all the audio waveforms just by merging the channels in. It's, it's quite simple. It just takes the stereo channels from all the guys, put, merges them together, and then puts them into a um, a, a trail chop. And it, it matches the window length of the sample um, window that or of the FFT size that you that you set. And then you can also do an audio spectrum on that. So what you end up with is all the audio waveforms for the all the stems and all of the audio spectrum waveforms using this method of matching the sample output length to the FFT size and merge, merges them all together in this Come back, Jared is, uh, in this case, 8,102 pixels wide by 32 channels of 32-bit 32 32-bit <laughs> 32 data. Um, and then it, what's cool um, is you can pack this uh, using the pack chop. And the pack chop takes a 32-bit texture, in this case, like a red channel from a 32-bit texture, and it, takes the, and it makes an 8-bit um, texture out of it with RGBA. So it takes all that 32-bit data and it puts it into, sorts it into um, uh, four 8-bit uh, channels. And then what you can do is you can um, take the audio track. Then you can, with an 8-bit video file animation codec, you can write out this as a movie file. So, and then if you take the audio file from 
or the main mix, the main mix, like the, the mix track from all of these, which is either done by summing all the tracks or by, um, or if you maybe just have an audio file that has the mix already, you drag that to the movie file out for the audio chop, uncompressed 24 bit, click record, then you'll create a movie file with an audio, um, with a, you'll create a, a, an archive of the whole track with all the stems and all the frequency channels for all for everything, all the waveforms and all packed into uh, one file. So from there, then you can then like close touch. Now you've got just the movie file, which in this case like it's an eight minute long song. It's 19 gigabyte file, but it plays back really fast on a decent computer. Um, you just read in the movie file, uh, and you'll see it just looks like a bunch of noise down there. But um, then you can um, uh, get the audio track from the movie file, just the generic way that you get a real movie file, and then you can turn on the audio. Um, yeah, I guess maybe you can hear. So this is this audio is coming out of the baked file, and then it, and then you pack it back the way it came in. So you unpack it as a, as a as a just a, um, a red channel audio 32-bit file. Then you've got your data back in the file. So this came out of the movie file, right? So this is the channel data back in your file, and this is all of the information in my mind that you really need from the audio file, already packed, already done, already analyzed, baked in, right? And then uh, from there, you can uh, da, 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 da. you can do the same trick I did before, but in this case, like I just really quickly did like the simple version, because I stacked all the channels on top of them, which are 15 channels of audio spectrum. And then I did the same transform and feedback loop, but I offsetted by 15 steps instead of one step. And so that's what gives you uh, this here. So. What's cool is if this is set to a locked time, we've got a scrubbable data set now. Um, Jared, we're currently you're cutting out quite a bit currently from okay. the extra music. Yeah. Okay. So, can you hear me now? Hello. Yeah. This is good. Okay. So yeah. So the audio file. So and then like quite easy. So this is the data. This is the spectral data. All steps formatted in some way, which is up to you. This could drive a shaker, drive a something. You're still cutting out, Jared. Am I really? Mm -hmm. Oh, I know why. Probably because of audio. You can hear me now. Yeah, yeah now it's better. All right, the audio systems. Okay, so um, yeah. So anyway, this is just it's packed in a particular way. So this is. The end, the, the end point here is like you got to kind of be creative about how you take the spectral data and how you're going to pack it into a 2D texture and how you're going to drive things. You might just be taking one of these channels and, and driving it, right? Right. It's not necessarily all of them. This is the whole track's audio spectrum relayed onto the screen uh, using feedback. And then you can, you know, uh, the simple example I just gave is if you feed it through an RGB delay, you get RGB plus as well, right? So there's a, a, a million or it's infinite ways of, of dealing with the data. But anyway, so that's a way to kind of maybe make your life easier um, uh, is to pack your audio like that. Uh, and then if your systems all read it like that, it could get a lot easier to kind of deal with uh, audio analysis stuff. So, okay, thank you, Ben. Well, now. Hello, everybody. Everybody's That's still there. Good stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yep, we're all here. Uh, yeah, I was just I was just writing in the chat that we should put the files from uh, from this session on the in session eleven event page. Yeah, or should we like have a? How do we do this best? Mm -hmm. How do we post all these files? We never did that really, but we should probably. Yeah. So event page is best, I guess, and we'll definitely Maybe. send it to you. Yeah. yeah, we'll figure it out. Definitely. Mm -hmm. um, oh, we, yeah, yeah, we'll figure it out. Yeah, no. GitHub. GitHub, yeah. 
Qué rápido. rápido. Any questions? <laughs> no, people, people seem happy. This is bananas. Very chill. Plastic man. Plastic man. Packing. <laughs> <laughs> Head on uh, fire. Yeah. All good. Yeah. Day's work. <laughs> How about your Paula? Is that? Um... <laughs> I love the transparent and shiny material. It's like, oh, I can do this. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe to tonight I'm going to work in that and create visuals. So thank you, uh, Jared. It's amazing. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks for the inspiration for that. That's really cool. Uh, I kept seeing Aurora on Aurora on Jupiter, and then it, it, it and then it was like the really bioluminescent deep sea little micro creatures. Super cool. Yep. Yeah. Well, thanks for asking that question, Paula. Yeah, cool questions. Thank you, Paula. <laughs> Thank you to you to answer. And I guess... Thank you to everybody for tuning in and uh, asking questions and... Uh, yeah, and we'll see you back perhaps in a month or something like this. Um, seems to be a good cycle every four weeks. So we'll see you all in April. And I'll probably say goodbye with yeah, that. Have, have a good, have a good four weeks till then. Yeah, and have a nice spring get, and so, a good autumn. Yeah, have a nice spring. And uh, if you have questions, definitely. Uh, fill out our in-session form and uh, as always yeah. <laughs> okay. bye everybody All right. thank you Paula bye.